Welcome to another one of our live sessions with experts in the field of digital online learning, learning analytics and related fields. One of the things that we've been discussing in this course so far is just the need to take a research informed perspective on the challenges that we're facing. Yes, it's a crisis moment. By the same account, we can make decisions based on what some of the best learning technology, educational technology research has to offer. Pleased today to have a, a guest, uh, Vidimir Kovanovic, who is a colleague uh, uh, that I've known for, for probably about seven or eight years now. Uh, his area of expertise is broadly in learning analytics and a set of related fields, and I think provides some good insight for faculty who are new into moving into the online environment. Vida, why don't we start with a little bit about yourself? Uh, thanks, George. So um, I'm a research fellow at the University of South Australia, and uh, my research is in learning analytics. And uh, I finished my PhD in computer science uh, a few years ago. Uh, I'm a software um, engineer by background, so I was working a few years in the software industry and then moved to, to academia. Uh, my research is primarily around the use of learning analytics to support uh, learning in higher education. Uh, however, in more recent times, I'm starting to, to, to work more towards use of learning analytics in primary secondary space, which turned out to be more challenging than, than originally anticipated. And um, yeah, uh, my work uh, up to this point was in um, a in many ways around detecting and supporting uh, students in their study, detecting good uh, productive study strategies and uh, understanding how the role of um, student engagement plays out on student success. So, and those are, I think, terrific areas of interest for participants in the course relating to you know, yes, right now it's a crisis thing over the next little while, but given the expectation that this is going to run for months and possibly even, you know, 18 months plus over a year, there's a lot of focused design that needs to happen uh, in the next semester leading up to, to the spring or fall semester, depending on what part of the world you're located in. So if you're dealing with faculty now that are starting to look ahead, they've, over the last couple of weeks, many of them have sort of normalized their online instruction. They may have settled on Teams or Zoom or discussion forums or Canvas or whatever, but they're now starting to turn a little bit of their attention to what they need to be aware of for more focused planning in, in the next semester. What kind of advice would you give them based on sort of your research that they could incorporate in their planning and in their design? So, so two things that are very, very important are really, uh, first of all, course design. So there is one difference when it comes to face to for online and face to face is that how much influence you can have uh, during the course. So if something happens uh, in the classroom, there is a you know much higher immediacy. You can, you can change things much faster. Whereas in online environment, there is an email, there is a you know Zoom link doesn't work or a course description, the assignment description wasn't clear enough and so on. It's much harder to get that information. So the design is more important in online environments by the fact that we are not so close to communicate any misunderstanding and resolve that very quickly. That's one. And uh, the other one is uh, around uh, how to support social interaction. So it's um, it really depends also on the on on the level of learning. So in higher education, it's obviously easier than in uh, say primary or secondary setting, uh, but it's still um, it's it's still not the same as having people in the in the room. And uh, for example, that's why there, there's need for higher and stronger presence of an instructor to support those early uh, interactions among students. Uh, Another thing, uh, when it comes to design, so it, it's important that you know the course is is, is properly designed and thought out uh, uh, before it starts. Uh, the one thing that that's also specific to online environments is that students have much more autonomy. They need to have much more autonomy in their learning. So it's it can never be, and it shouldn't be, replication of face-to-face -face learning because it cannot be, because students are learning on their own in their own environments with all of the you know life happening on the, on the side and um, there is a much stronger presence of, of human agency there um, thing also to consider as, as a researcher uh, in the field is uh, 
um, the, the notion of something called design for learning rather than design of learning. So we can never design how students are going to, to learn. They will be learning in their own environment, their own pace, the way they're gonna use the different resources. Are they gonna talk to each other on Slack or over email or have their own private Zoom, whatever. We can only facilitate and support them as, as, as best to our ability. So the, 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 in many ways, the role of instructor shifts to, to provide an environment where students will then themselves, these, you know, design their own learning in a sense. They will all pick what they will do, how they will do, and so on. And and that's not not easy because uh, uh, and we know from research students are often not using effective learning strategies. They're not using. They're not uh, approaching learning uh, in, a, uh, in, in in a proper way. Uh, and there are many reasons for it. One, of, first of all, we are rarely taught how to learn. So we go to 20 something years of schooling and we're never taught how, how would you learn something, right? And often uh, you, it's very hard to, to, to uh, appreciate value of certain things or certain approaches to learning uh, if you ever never experienced them. For example, we know that summarizing and writing a summary is a very effective uh, uh, learning strategy, whereas if you never done that and actually see that in practice, you would not think of that. You would say, no, I'm not gonna do that. Or for example, if you never participated in an online community and learn from your peers, you won't think necessarily that posting on question in online discussion is gonna be useful learning you know, learning activity to, to first of all, uh, there are several things there. First of all, to, to, to write your question, to understand and clearly articulate what you don't know, engage with others, summarize, see different opinions, and so on. So all of those things uh, would be something that many students wouldn't do necessarily um, when, they, uh, when they are in an online environment. And all of this is harder because there is this difference, be distance between uh, students and teachers and how we will you know, support them. Uh, Another thing that's, uh, that's uh, tricky is uh, uh, providing a good um, uh, assessment. So having an assessment that's tied to the learning, um, learning objectives. So for example, I'm, I've seen situations where, uh, I don't know, it's a programming course, for example, but then the students are assessed on their presentation and they were how, well, whether their presentation of 15 minutes or 10 minutes. Yep, that's okay, assessment, uh, and you know, whether it's clear, nicely designed, so yep, that's, that's decent uh, uh, assessment, but the problem is it's not tied to the goal of the, of, the, of the course. If the goal is learning programming, then assessing the quality of presentation is completely, uh, uh, you know, inappropriate or for example writing an essay on how would you uh, do something so those things are very very hard uh, to do and given that it's an online environment it's very tricky sometimes to to provide assessment that's that's tied to the goals um, so, so yeah, I'm wondering if, some of my... yeah so I'm wondering if uh, you know to to sort of um detail for teachers so i think there's a trick points we're not taught how to learn where study strategies are critical in learning process as faculty move online the importance of having proper learning design to activate those study strategies and to provide support are all central to creating an effective learning environment i think on the, the final question i'd like to sort of throw your way is you're now approaching the next semester uh, as a faculty member and you're you've got deep expertise in the domain of learning analytics Based on what you've shared about learning design, study strategies, and the need for uh, students to become capable of exceeding or being successful in this new environment, what would you advise to academics who want to do a better job of working with those types of data? What could they or should they be thinking about from a learning analytics lens to start making progress on any one of those number of points that you raised? So, Analytics are a great thing if they are well integrated with the rest of the course. So often analytics are used, hey, let me see the data I'm getting out of my course, which is where well, the problem there is, it's not a generally bad, uh, you know, that's how doctors will do. Okay, let's see 
uh, you know, data from hospitals or data from clinical trials and so on. The problem is uh, the data we get is, is much less reliable because students are learning on their own. So for example, if our data is the number of logins that student did or how many times student down, uh, viewed a certain page, that can mean something, but also uh, doesn't have to mean uh, something important because students, for example, can learn on their own, uh, you know, offline with their friends over, say in this case, in the lockdown over Zoom or they will go to a coffee shop. Uh, in some better times and you know learn learn uh, in the ways that you that your data is not providing uh, information on. so uh, the use of analytics will also need to be integrated with the design so uh, that the, the data that's being captured is reflective of what's actually happening so for example it's one thing if we said uh, you know, we're going to look at the number of whether student downloaded a certain page or how many times they accessed LMS if the goal, if they're going to be learning, or uh, you know, if the assignment is, for example, um, you know, an individual essay. Whereas, if the assignment, if the, if the learning tasks are, uh, you need to post a discussion message and you need to engage in, uh, with other students to come with a certain, um, you know, group decision and so on. In that case there actually is, that data is reliable because then they cannot do that on Zoom or in face-to-face. -face. The goal is to do in a certain way in a course, so then the data will be more uh, reliable. So then, if student didn't access the discussion, that will mean something else. Whereas, if those were not you know, part of the design or part of the learning activity, just say, hey, you have discussions, that doesn't mean anything. So it's really, in many ways, what data mean depends on the design. And I think one of the things for, uh, you know, a lot of faculty to focus on too is there are tool sets that are often available by the university that can look at rudimentary things like engagement based on frequency of login and so on. So I think even though uh, faculty is currently a bit overwhelmed with moving curriculum online, the opportunities to start to use even the limited data collection that is being done by an LMS or uh, opportunities for analysis in discussion forums and so on. By using some of the tools like any Canvas suite or Blackboard or otherwise, you can still start to get a little bit at study strategies that then could influence subsequent learning design, social network analysis that could give you an indication of whether your social learning tasks are being properly implemented and so on. So if you were to say just a tool or two that you would recommend a faculty member to use in a practical way starting next semester, would, would is there anything that readily comes to mind for you? Uh, yes, but uh, now, I mean, now it's, it's really talking about if the lockdown continues and you, you know, uh, faculty staff needs to teach from home, well, in that case, their IT support is very, very limited. So in that case, anything new cannot be uh, you know, implemented. So in that case, uh, that's a one thing. But if, if we're just talking about the regular, uh, uh, you know, learning online, yeah, there are many tools and one that immediately comes to mind is, is on task. For example, a, a, a tool that, uh, um, it's, it's a very simple tool, almost like a grade book. We have students as, as rows and the columns will be different kinds of measures. The number of times students logged in, the student posted messages, did this, that, all kinds of different measures as columns, right? Not, not, nothing special. And then uh, instructors can first of all see the different measures that are being constructed and more importantly, send personalized messages to students. Almost think of it as a mail merge uh, where the fields in your message can be customized for students. So for example, you can send message to students who uh, achieved 80% or more on the, on the exam, however, never used online discussion. You can tell them, hey, you know, good job on the you know, last assignment. However, I noticed that you haven't done, uh, haven't used discussions. Maybe you should try that and that might help you, uh, you know, achieve even more. Whereas for the other group of students who achieve below 80 or, you know, a certain percent the teacher, the, the instructor designs, uh, you know, you can send something completely different. So for them, you might focus, I don't know, on practice quizzes or, or more access to something else. So it enables you to de design your own uh, personalized feedback messages to students 
uh, and um, they, they're really personalized with the actual data from about the given student and also at the same time they're automated automated so uh, over time as the course uh, you know goes through several iteration those messages and those rules on how to send the messages are, are still there so teach can can really use them to, to provide some additional support to students and uh, however that will also need to be installed by the university so i'm thinking you know in in, if, in coronavirus might not be the, the best uh, time to do that uh, in lms there are a lot of data as well so looking just the frequency of different activities However, all of that needs to be, uh, you know, interpreted based on the course design. So if there's a certain course, for example, that is very, you know, limited discussion activity by week five, and there is a heavy activity by week five, those are the data will mean different things. So that's why it's really in a learning analytics, it's very unique there in that sense that it's really important to know what's happening in the course. That's why it's very hard to build generic analytics. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks very much for, for the, the insights there. I think there's a loop between new pedagogical practices, moving content online, the uh, using data to improve both the learning design, the teaching practices, the learning strategies of students and so on. There's a nicely integrated loop there, but of course, time and effort are the key criteria there. And there's a lot of uh, things up in the air as, as you know, this age of COVID continues to unfold. So what we'll do is share some of your articles as well as resources with uh, students in the course as well, Vita. So thanks for taking the time to chat with us. Much appreciated. Thanks, George.